Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to say a few words about the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and the topic at hand. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community is a fast-growing international revival movement within Islam. By the grace of God, it is the single largest Muslim community in the world. Tens of, mil tens of millions of Muslim adherents united both in belief and practice under the hand of a single Khalifa, a single spiritual leader. The community was founded by Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, peace be upon him whom Ahmadi Muslims take to be the Prophet Messiah and define reformer that is awaited by Islam and in fact all major religions. He claimed that he was commissioned to bring Muslims back to the true original teachings that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, taught to spread peace and tolerance that the true Islam teaches and to reconnect man with the living God who hears as he always did and speaks as he has always done. The motto of the community is love for all, hatred for none. The views of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community on certain issues diverge from that of Orthodox Islam, and we firmly believe that this interpretation is fully grounded within, within authentic Islamic source material. Tonight's talks will focus on answering questions such as, are women treated as second-class citizens by Islam? What rights does the religion give to women? And what is the philosophy behind the Islamic veil? And the state, and is the state of many women in Muslim countries today reflective of the two teachings of Islam? Our speaker today is Fazana Yusuf, who is a member of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Uh, Fazana read, uh, read law here at Queen Mary's University, completing her postgraduate professional training from the College of Law, London. She qualified as a solicitor at an international city law firm and now is a senior lawyer specializing in oil and gas sector. Prasanna has spoken and written on women's rights in Islam, female expression, and on human rights issues. She is married, lives in London, and has a young son. Our second speaker was confirmed, Riyaz Mokho, who represented Tel Mama, which is measuring anti-Muslim attacks, who provides service that allows people from across the London to report any forms of anti-Muslim abuse. Uh, was confirmed, but unfortunately hasn't come and hasn't replied to our recent email, so I apologize for that. Um, so now I'd like to hand over to Ms. Thank you. In the name of God, the gracious, the merciful. Good evening, everyone. Respected chairperson, fellow panelists, distinguished guests, my dear brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you. It's an honor and privilege to be invited to speak today in such a distinguished environment and in front of such a high quality audience. I'm also especially privileged to speak in this glorious university, which was the conduit for my own education. My days here were the happiest of my student life. My name is Farzana Yusuf and I'm a member of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. By way of introduction, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is a peaceful Muslim community that is established in 204 countries worldwide with tens of millions of members. It was established in 1889 by His Holiness Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of Ghadiyan al-Islam who claimed to be the promised messiah and reformer awaited by all major religions. He is succeeded by elected Khalifas who provide spiritual leadership. The current Khalifa is His Holiness, Mirza Musru Ahmed. He is the fifth Khalifa of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Our motto is love for all, hatred for none. We believe that Islam does not compel any person to a particular religious belief. We believe that the Quranic edict that there is no compulsion in religion ensures that those who follow the Holy Quran faithfully would not place restrictions on the free practice of faith. That freedom of religion and belief applies equally to women as it does to men. If some of the newspapers are to be believed that as a Muslim woman, I must be a backward, oppressed, uneducated, 
full-face veiled subordinate in a male-dominated world. Let me set the record straight. There are occasions when I am backward, but that is only when I'm driving my car in reverse. <laughs> so, despite what some media might surmise, and as my bumper and driveway will testify, I don't do backwards very well. In fact, I'm a scarf-wearing Muslim woman, a mother, a lawyer, and today, a public representative of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Contrary to some stereotypes, my religion has allowed me to be educated, emancipated, and liberated. So, if today's question is, does feminism have a place in Islam? Based on how Islam has treated me, the answer must be yes. Feminism, as a promoter of women's rights, does have a place in Islam. Indeed, Islam actively secures the rights of women. Now, some will balk at that idea. They'll refer to the Saudi bans on women driving cars, forced marriages, and the disgustingly titled honor killings as examples of an anti-female Islam. To them, I say, judge Islam on its teachings, not on the actions of a few people that have come many hundreds of years afterwards with their own non-Islamic cultural influences. Judge Islam by the millions of women in the Ahmadiyya Muslim community that are, among others, mothers, engineers, doctors, judges, businesswomen, journalists, lawyers, scientists, psychologists, and teachers. Today, I will explain why Islam and the women within the Ahmadiyya Muslim community are the perfect embodiment of honest Islamic feminism. If feminism is a struggle for women's rights, to understand whether Islam is consistent with women's rights, we have to look at how Islam is regulated. In essence, how is it defined? Islam is defined by its teachings. In Islam, rights and obligations are set out in three hierarchical sources. The first is the Holy Quran. This is the supreme and unaltered representation of Islamic doctrine. It is supreme because Muslims regard it as being the word of God. Any practice which goes against the Holy Quran cannot be regarded as being Islamic. Second is the practice of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Muslims call that Sunnah. Third is what the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, said as recorded in authentic books. These are the Hadiths. In the event of any inconsistency, the hierarchy of Quran, Sunnah, and then Hadith applies. Let me be clear. If you read or hear reports of a fatwa being issued by a religious cleric, it cannot be considered as the view of Islam if it contradicts these sources of Islamic doctrine. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community derives its Islamic doctrine solely from the Holy Quran, Hadith, and the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Today, I will express to you my honestly held views. Those views will be based on the documented teachings of Islam and how they are applied within the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. By the end of this short address, I hope that you'll come to share my view that Islam, practiced according to its proper teachings, emancipates women and is a source of both courage and peace. So, what is feminism? The Oxford Dictionary defines feminism as the advocacy of women's rights based on the equality of the sexes. It encompasses legal and political rights. The term feminism has its roots in France in the 1880s. By the first decade of the 20th century, the term made its appearance in England, first in Britain, and then in the 1910s in the United States. Suffragette movements predominantly in the USA and the UK during the 19th and 20th century also united women from different backgrounds in the struggle for voting rights. Up until relatively recently in Britain, the situation for women was at best uncomfortable, at worst in servitude, because they had little or no rights. 
Before the Married Women's Property Act of 1882 was passed, the law defined women as femme covert. It emphasized that a woman was subordinate to her husband. Until 1882, a woman in Britain was not a person in her own right and could not keep her property or leave it in her will. She had no right to divorce her husband either. It was only the enactment of the Matrimonial Causes Act in 1923 which allowed women in Britain to divorce their husbands because of misconduct. It was precisely this situation that fueled the feminist movements. The situation was the same in the pre-Islamic era of the 6th century. In fact, it was worse. Women were often regarded as chattels to be discarded or used as gambling chips. They had no spiritual, economic, social, or human rights. They didn't even have the rights to own their own children, with many female babies being buried alive. But Islam changed all of that. Islam preeminently guaranteed women's rights 1,200 years before they came to Britain and elsewhere. The right of a woman to be recognized as an independent person, both spiritually and socially, to own property, to be a master of her own earnings, to have the right to divorce, all of which were prohibited in Britain until 1882 and beyond, were guaranteed by Islam from the year 610 onwards, when the Holy Quran began to be revealed. Muslim women are vouchsafed those rights in a way that is still beyond what many legal systems secure for women today. Islam has recognized and codified women's rights clearly. The source of these assertions is the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran recorded God's perspectives on men and women, defining them as equals and in partnership with one another. It says that men and women are legal persons and have their own rights, which can be exercised both in society and as part of their marital relationship with each other. In recognizing women as a legal person, the Holy Quran says at chapter 39, verse 7, He has created you from a single being, then of the same kind made its mate. That recognition gives women rights as well as the ability to enforce them. The Holy Quran goes on to ensure women's equality on a spiritual, intellectual, social, and economic level. In securing equality and equity for men and women, the Holy Quran only differentiates on conduct, not gender. The Holy Quran says at chapter 4, verse 125, that whoever does good work, whether they be male or female, shall enter paradise. It goes on to provide, in chapter 33, verse 36, a lengthy series of identical rights and attributes for both men and women. That equity extends to economic rights too. Muslim women have always had rights over their property and their earnings. That economic freedom and independence is central to principles of modern feminism. The Holy Quran is explicit in ensuring those rights. Chapter 4, verse 33 provides that men shall have the share of what they have earned and women shall have the share of what they have earned. Whether inherited or earned, Islam entitles women to possess and utilize wealth and the property of their own. Chapter 4, verse 35 of the Holy Quran goes on to further protect the rights of a woman in a family environment by placing duties on men to be guardians over women spending out of his wealth. These principles reinforce the economic freedom given to women by Islam and ingrain a legal duty on a husband to be the financial guardian of his wife. Men do not have any right over the earnings of women. So, Islam offers women a degree of economic strength which modern day feminism has still not been able to achieve. If the family unit breaks down, women were also granted the right to seek a divorce. 
Those rights were promised long before they were recognized in modern society. Although divorce is permissible, Islam seeks to protect the family unit. Islam even provides for arbitration to avoid a divorce, a process that has only recently become part of the family court structure. The understanding of a woman's right to manage her property or seek a divorce can only properly be exercised if a woman has knowledge of it. This brings me on to one of the big anti-feminist views on Islam. When it comes to women's education, media reports on bans on female education in Afghanistan and the sad story of Malala Yousafzai perpetuate a degenerative perception of Islam. The reality is that such actions find no basis in Islam. Contrary to the view of some, women in Islam are encouraged to seek education. When in chapter 20, verse 115, the Holy Quran invites us to increase our knowledge, it does not differentiate between men and women. The Holy Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, was similarly clear in his view about education. He said that the pursuit of knowledge was a duty, a duty on every Muslim man and woman. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, encouraged his wives to seek knowledge. He once stated, half of the religion of Islam could be learned from Hazrat Aisha. Hazrat Aisha was his wife. Hazrat Aisha had a brilliant mind and was in intellect and wisdom so superior <coughs> that she was given the title Horizon of the Ladies of Islam. She was not only free to express herself, her judicial decrees were accepted by the believers or successors of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, on a variety of matters. She is the source of reports of more than 2,000 hadiths and had committed the Holy Quran to memory. Her work led directly to the development and methodology of jurisprudence and scholarly interpretation. Hazrat Aisha was a strong, respected, and highly learned Muslim woman who is an example for us all. The women of early Islam demonstrate that rather than being oppressed, women were at the forefront of every sphere of free expression and Islamic and worldly progression. Early women excelled in education, knowledge, fine arts, industry, trade, commerce, medicine, and law. In keeping with that, you'll find that Muslim women today, especially Ahmadi Muslim women, are often well educated. So, the conclusion is definitive. Islam entitles women to work, choose their own style of Islamic dress, be educated, hold property, seek a remedy in an unhappy marriage, and be in charge of their earnings. Reports of women who are forced to wear burqas marry or being denied education simply have no basis in Islam. Against that, feminism as an isolated concept has some struggles. On the one hand, it seeks absolute equality with men, and on the other hand, fails to recognize the need for equity. In ensuring equity, or in plain English fairness, one must take into account the circumstances of men and women. I'm a strong and independent woman, but do I want to play against men on an American football field? No, and I suspect the answer of many other women would be the same. Do I expect women to run, swim, or take part in weightlifting or judo against men at the 2016 Olympics? No, and neither does the International Olympic Committee. And the reason for that is that although women should have equality of rights, one cannot reasonably seek to impose an equality of constitution. That's because men and women are constituted differently. Men cannot be mothers, just as women cannot be fathers. They have been created differently because they offer society different skills. A mother who has three children and needs to get them all out of bed, washed, dressed, fed, and off to school on time every morning whilst managing the strong personalities of each child is an absolute master of negotiation, management, and problem-solving skills. 
Companies, too, recognize the differences between male and female skills. Other than for reputational reasons, the inherent differences between men and women are one of the main reasons why organizations globally seek gender diversity in their workforce. When it comes to family life, Islam is no different. It recognizes the differences in skills between men and women and the roles that each has. Whilst women can work, be educated, and have all the social rights of men, their constitution makes them better suited than men to manage family life. And because men are generally physically stronger than women, their role is to be the guardians of the family. To impose upon women the role of men, or to impose upon men the role of women, is to place around their necks the most burdensome of yokes. And in doing so, we would, in the name of rights, banish the right to be a man or to be a woman, replacing freedom with the suppression of what it means to be gender diverse. And so, if feminism is about the rights of women, it would succeed best if it were to recognize the distinction between equality of rights and equality of constitution. If it were to do so, women would be recognized equally, but also equitably. So where does that take us in the future? When it comes to the health of our society, we must move beyond a conversation about the individual rights of one gender over another. Instead, we must examine our conscience and in the recognition that the foundations of our world are built on principles of interdependency, we mustn't seek to make men women and women men. Neither should we ask for rights for women and men alone. Rather, our exercise of rights must allow mankind to coexist in an environment in which we are collectively responsible for the health and future of our society. Ahmadi Muslim women are an embodiment of free but responsible Muslim women. When Britain has needed us, we have been at the forefront, supporting our country with passion and loyalty. Charity events run by Ahmadi Muslims raise thousands of pounds for British charities, including Great Ormond Street and Help the Aged. Ahmadi Muslim women have planted tens of thousands of trees for the environment, and our work in the community transcends boundaries of colour and religion, helping the needy, the elderly and the disaffected wherever we find them. And when Islam or other religions are treated disdainfully, we respond appropriately. You won't find us demonstrating in the streets, burning flags, using foul language, or breaching the peace. Instead, our women respond with intelligence and measure, using the pen to put into practice our Islamic teachings, promoting peace and harmony at every juncture. Ahmadi Muslim women exercise their rights by showing compassion for society, loyalty to our country, and demonstrating, above all, that Islam is for peace, unity, and justice. They are a balance of moderation, neither taking an ultra-conservative nor an ultra-modernist view of Islam. And at the same time, Ahmadi Muslim women maintain their homes and spend time educating and nurturing their children, ensuring that the near 100% literacy rate in the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is maintained. Furthermore, they take charge of preparing their children to take on the responsibility for the peaceful, just, and fair future of our world. That is a representation of the feminism within the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, a feminism that recognizes the rights of God as well as the rights of his creation. A feminism which allows the exercise of wide-ranging rights for women, but appreciates both the collective and individual responsibilities of men and women in safeguarding the future of our world. To those who accuse Islam of being anti-women, I would say, don't look at the actions of the few to stigmatize the whole. Instead, Look at the teachings of Islam and the example of Ahmadi Muslim women. 
the message of peace, justice, fairness, and responsibility expressed by the promised Messiah alayhi salam in his books and discourses and those of our Khalifa in scores of speeches stand as an encyclopedic reference point for all those who seek the truth about Islam and the rights that it vouchsafes for women. Ahmadi Muslim women are the manifestation of these magnificent freedoms in Islam. Women who are strong, yet sensitive, expressive, yet animated, learned, yet impressionable. May Allah grant us all the wisdom to utilize our every faculty in the propagation of a world in which the rights, freedoms, and responsibilities of men and women are valued, respected, and conveyed. Thank you for listening. May God bless you all.